Uh, my name is Mark McCormick. I'm the Education Specialist here at the Environmental Nature Center. And I have some friends close to me. We're talking about radical reptiles today. But we can't just be looking at animals who happen to be reptiles for fun. That's not what we're doing here today. Today we are going to be a scientist. And scientists try and figure out how, well, what sort of superpowers and adaptations that animals have to live where they live in their habitat. So scientists break up animals from different groups so that they can better classify them and understand them. And one of those groups is reptiles. So today we're going to talk about what makes a reptile a reptile and the different sort of adaptations that some of our reptile friends have to survive in their habitat. Now all throughout today, if you have any questions or comments, make sure to leave uh, those in the comment section and we'll try to get to them at the end um, of our live session today. But if we don't get to them, we'll answer them later on today. So feel free to add your comments and your questions. So the first animal friend that we're going to meet today is one that you may have met already. It is a person, well not a person, a uh, rosy boa that we call Fiesta. You may have seen Fiesta on YouTube. Uh, she's pretty famous. Fiesta is a rosy boa. And she likes, likes to live in the deserts of Southern California. Mostly, not really in the sand, but kind of in the rocks and the mountains. And a lot of the rocks and the mountains that you see in the desert are kind of like the rocks, some of the rocks that are behind me. They're light colored, uh, some pinks, grays, and browns. And so she has really uh, special colors to blend in. We call that camouflage. But her skin is not camouflage. She actually doesn't have skin. She has scales. And these scales are almost like armor, and they protect her. Uh, and their scales are made of the same thing as your fingernails. And imagine if you were covered in fingernails. You might get some strange looks, but if you fell and tripped and landed in a cactus, would you need a Band-Aid? No. If you fell off your bike, would you need a Band-Aid? No. But her, uh, you would have special armor. Her scales are like armor, and they help to protect her. And one of the things that makes a reptile a reptile is that they have scales. They don't have skin. So all reptiles have scales, and each one has special scales for doing something unique, for surviving. My friend has scales that are really, really, really smooth. You can see she almost looks shiny and wet and slimy. She's not slimy. Her scales are just smooth, and that helps her to uh, move around in the desert. And during the daytime, it gets really, really hot in the desert. So what she does is she digs a hole underground, and she goes to sleep during the daytime, and then she's awake at nighttime. We call that nocturnal and her scales help her to move all around underneath the ground. And it's pretty helpful. And then if you look at the bottom of her scale, or bottom of her body, her scales are a little bit different. They're kind of longer, kind of wider, and those are called scoots, and those help her to scoot around on the ground, which is pretty nice. Let's see if she'll move around on the ground for us right now. She might not, uh, for another reason that we'll talk about a little bit later, but let's see if she'll move around on the ground for us now. moving a little bit and you can see with her tongue she's not sticking her tongue out at the camera because she's being rude she's sticking her tongue out because she's smelling snakes will smell with their tongue so they stick out their tongue and they stick it back in their mouth and they have a special organ called a Jacobson organ that helps them to smell with their tongue it's a pretty interesting adaptation go ahead and try if you're at home uh, plug your nose and stick your tongue out and see if you can smell we're gonna do a little experiment uh, most of you cannot smell with your tongue. We don't have that adaptation, but my friend uh, Fiesta, the rosy boa, does. I'll go ahead and pick her up. She's probably a little bit cold right now. So, bad news about Fiesta scales is as she grows, her scales are not going to grow with her. Like your skin grows with you. It's almost like your clothes. You don't wear the same clothes you wore five years ago, right? You don't wear the same clothes you wore when you were a baby. You have to buy new clothes as you grow bigger. My friend has to... Well, not buy new clothes, but get new uh, scales. And she does this by shedding her skin. So every month or so, she'll shed her, her scales off. And we call that snake shed. And as she grows, she gets new scales that help grow with her body as she continues growing. And snakes will grow throughout their life. They don't stop growing after they're a year old or two years old or like my friend here, four years old. They'll continue to grow throughout their lives if they have enough food and if they have enough space. You can come and check out my friend's space, my friend's habitat, 
at the Environmental Nature Center. She actually lives in our museum, and you can see her habitat. But I want to show you something else pretty cool. So everybody wave goodbye and say, bye-bye, Fiesta. One of the other animals we have here is another native uh, snake in the museum, but I didn't bring her. I brought some of her shed. As she sheds her scales, we actually pick it up and keep it for use for teaching other scientists like you in different schools for our traveling naturalist pro programs, also for our field trips here at the Environmental Nature Center. And you can see the scales a lot better this way, and it kind of feels like a plastic bag. And you can see the big, big scales, those are the scoots on the bottom of her body. This is from a Pacific gopher snake named Diamond. Feels pretty interesting. Okay, so all reptiles need to have scales. That's one of the things that makes it a reptile. A reptile, so I have bad news for you, you can't be a reptile. Because you're a human being, you have skin. Your dog or your cat, they can't be reptiles either. But snakes definitely are reptiles because they have those scales. Have you ever seen any other types of animals around your house that might have scales? Maybe ones that do push-ups in the sun? Like lizards, right? You can see some lizards a lot of times here at the Environmental Nature Center, but right now, if you do see some, please let me know. Let me know in the comments that you saw a lizard run behind me. I always like to check out most lizard sightings. So, let's go ahead and meet another friend of ours to talk about dark scales. This one is another famous animal that you may have just seen on YouTube. Her name is Kevin. Kevin is a bearded dragon. And as you can see, she definitely has some scales. Very, very interesting scales that also help her to camouflage, but she doesn't live in the deserts of Southern California. She actually is from the deserts of Australia. And she has a really uh, long list of cool adaptations I wanna talk to you about, but since we're just talking about what makes a reptile a reptile, let's talk about one of her really interesting ones that makes her a reptile. So reptiles, are what we call cold-blooded and that means that their body changes temperature in the sun it goes up their temperature goes up in the cold like it is right now their body temperature goes down and they can survive with their body changing temperatures you can't if your body temperature goes down you have to go to the doctor if your body temperature goes up you have to get you have to go to the doctor because you have a fever my friend can change her blood temperature to survive in different types of habitats. But that does mean that when she's cold, she doesn't really want to do anything. If you've ever had to wake up to get up to go to school and it's raining outside and you're under the covers, it's nice and comfy, it's pretty nice to be able to do that. But my friend is just like that when it's cold. She doesn't really want to go outside and she doesn't really want to move. But when she's warm, she wants to go outside, she wants to find food and she wants to play. So she has a couple of different adaptations for her to try and get as warm as she can. One of those is she can kind of flatten her rib cage out like a pancake. You can see it's a little bit flat right now. She's trying to steal a little bit of my warmth from my hand. I am not a reptile, sadly. I'm a human being, so my body stays the same temperature all the time. Pretty warm, 98.6 degrees. But her, she's trying to steal a little bit of my warmth from my hand, so she's flattening out her stomach and her chest to try and have as much of her body touching my warm hand as she can. And it's a pretty superpower that she has another one that she has not really for staying warm but more for surviving is well she's not very fast she's not very mean she's not very strong she doesn't have sharp teeth she doesn't really have sharp claws but you may notice these spikes along the side of her head and the side of her body right now they're soft you can see them bending under my finger but when she gets angry those spikes will kind of become hard. If you ever had goosebumps and your hair sticks up on your arm, it's just like that. Those spikes will stick out and her cheeks will poof out. Oh, you can see her opening her mouth right there. Her cheeks will poof out and it'll turn dark around her cheeks and it kind of looks like a beard, like I have. And that makes her look really, really mean, like Mario, uh, Bowser from the Mario Brothers games, if you know those ones, pretty popular. So that helps her to survive just by looking really, really mean. So well, before she may have looked like a pretty big lizard, but now she looks like a really mean 
uh, lizard that's going to make some of her predators think twice about turning her into breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So something else you can see is I'm kind of holding her like she's a pancake, right? I have my hand out flat. If I'm going to hold her like you might pick up your dog or your cat kind of by the ribs, her tail's going to flail around just like that. It looks like she's a helicopter, like she's dancing. That's actually so she can find balance. She has a really long backbone and that backbone is super important to her. It helps keep her body steady, but also protects her spinal cord. So her brain can send information from the top of her body down to the tips of her tail. And having a vertebrae is one of the things that makes a reptile a reptile. All reptiles have a vertebrae, and I have good news. This is something that you have in common with Kevin and with Fiesta the Rosy Boa. Go ahead and feel your back and feel that little bumpy part that goes from your neck all the way down. That is your spine. You are what's called a vertebrate too, and your spine does the same job. It's super important. My friend has a spine too, and she is a vertebrate, and all reptiles are vertebrates. So reptiles need scales and they need to be cold blooded, which means their blood temperature can change. It can go up and down and up and down and up and down, depending on where they're living, where their habitat is, and they need a backbone. Let's go ahead and check out another one of her adaptations. That also makes her a reptile. Eggs. So my friend Kevin and Fiesta the Rosy Boa they weren't born as a baby. They didn't wear diapers and cry all the time. Instead, they were born as an egg, and then they hatched. And lots of different animals, like snakes, uh, they do the same thing. Reptiles are all born from eggs. But when, as soon as they're born, they don't need to learn the same things that you had to learn. Things like what's two plus two, uh, how to read, look both ways before you cross the road. Reptiles don't need to learn that, especially animals like snakes. So as soon as they're born, they split her off, and they go look for food shelter, water, and space, and they survive. They don't need to learn from their parents. Unlike us, we have to learn all those important things, but snakes and lots of reptiles don't need that. As soon as they hatch from their eggs, like these eggs from a California king snake, they are alive, they're on their own, and they're out in the world trying to survive. And it's good uh, news that all these different animals have really, really cool adaptations to do just that. Let's go ahead and meet one more friend who is also a reptile. But first, everybody wave and say, bye-bye, Kevin. This isn't Kevin's house, by the way. We have a lot bigger habitat for her to live in. If you want to check it out, uh, check out our YouTube page, and there's a video uh, called Cooking with Kevin or Lunch with Kevin, we find out what Kevin eats and we get to check out her house, which is a pretty cool house, I have to say. But my next friend doesn't even live inside. My next friend is an animal that likes to roam the deserts of Southern California all day, every day, looking for flowers. This is Waffle. Waffle is a California desert tortoise. And Waffle has scales. You can see the scales on her arms. Waffle is cold-blooded, and so she, her blood temperature can go up or down depending on where she's living and how cold it is or warm it is outside in her habitat. In fact, where she lives in the desert, it gets so hot during the daytime that she has to go ahead and take a nap underground. And that nap helps her to regulate her own body temperature because her body doesn't do it and she can't jump in the pool when she's hot. She can't wear shorts when she's hot. She can't put on a jacket when she's cold. So she has to move around and kind of regulate her own body temperature that way. But remember, she has to have a backbone, right? We're talking about how reptiles need a backbone to be a reptile. Do you think that she has a backbone underneath this shell? Even though you can't see it, she does have a backbone. Underneath her shell is a backbone. It's, her shell is connected to her body. She can't take it off like you can take off your sweater. She can't leave her shell like you can leave your house. Her shell is part of her body. In fact, as I touch her shell right now, she can feel that. Almost like if you touch your fingernail, you can feel that too. It's part of her body. Let's go ahead and take a look at how she walks along the ground.
She's not very fast, is she? Walking this slow, you'd walk pretty slow if your house was on your back too, but it also helps her to conserve water and energy in the desert where there's not a lot of food and not a lot of water to get down for her. It also helps her blend in with the desert rocks, and so her predators don't even think that she's a living thing. They think she's a rock, and that's pretty handy uh, camouflage to help her survive. But because we don't want to take off her shell, because it's part of her body, I do have another biofact for us to look at that is, well, it used to be the shell of a turtle. And we're going to try and see if we can find the spine on the turtle, the vertebrae. Can you see it inside? It goes right along the top of the inside of the shell. And that's where a turtle or a tortoise's spine would be. So even though we can't see or can't feel the vertebrae of our friend Waffle, or a turtle or a tortoise, they still have one. And it does the same job that yours does, and it's just as important as yours is, or Fiesta's, or Kevin, and it helps her to survive. It also means that she is a reptile. In fact, she's not just any reptile, she is our state reptile. If you happen to be lucky enough to live in California, like Waffle does, like I do, then you're, you have a state reptile, but you also have a state capital, a state flower, those bright orange California poppies that you see, state birds, um, a state flag, but our state reptile is Waffle, the California desert tortoise. And the kind of bad news I have about that is that she is actually an endangered species. Um, she lives in the Mojave Desert, and there's lots of different reasons that she's endangered. One of them is because they're they send out all of our, a lot of our trash there for landfills and it attracts different scavengers like crows and they actually eat the babies of the desert tortoises. They take a really long time in order to grow old enough to lay their own eggs, sometimes up to 20 years. And that can mean that because they can't survive, that's because it's a long time to survive in the wild and the desert, a lot of them die before they end up making more tortoises. Another reason is because out there in the desert, there's lots of different military uh, groups that like to practice out there, different maneuvers, and the military usually uses some dangerous stuff, and sometimes these animals get affected, but uh, every day, usually about once a year, uh, one of the groups of the Marine Corps that lives out there, they go out with their trucks, and they find as many California desert tortoises as they can. They load them up into their trucks, and they bring them to a place where they will be protected and out of harm's way, which is a pretty nice thing that they do. You can see Waffle looking around for food, and she's checking out any plants that she can eat. She doesn't eat McDonald's, she doesn't eat steak, she just eats plants. Her favorite are the flowers that grow in the Mojave Desert. And it's pretty nice that she eats plants because she has a special beak to eat, even hard plants like cactuses. And cactuses have lots and lots of water, and she gets most of her water from plants. In fact, she can survive up to a year without fresh water in the desert but she doesn't have to do that here at the environmental nature center because she's my co-worker and because she's my co-worker she's not a wild animal she gets to get paid she doesn't get paid in money she gets paid in free food a place to live and free vet visits in fact all of the different animals that you saw today that you'll see in the future at the ENC they're all my co-workers they're not wild animals so if you do see a wild animal outside what I want you to do is not pick it up because they're a wild animal. They could hurt you, but more likely you could hurt them, even on accident. But what I do want you to do is since we're talking about adaptations, I want you to try and figure out what that animal has to survive where it lives. Figure out if it's a reptile or a mammal or a bird or an arthropod. Lots of different classifications of animals that you can see just from your own window right now. You can even hear some birds right now at the ENC, but I bet you can hear some birds and see some birds at your own house, uh, out of your own window. In fact, uh, this Friday, we're having another live stream. Uh, one of our animal uh, experts, she's actually a bird expert, uh, uh, one of our lead naturalists, Heather, she's going to be giving us an introduction to birding. So make sure to turn, tune into that so you can identify the different birds that live here. On Wednesday, one of our bee experts, Raquel, she's going to be talking to us about pollinators and on the amazing things that they do to help us to survive, to help Waffle to survive. We're gonna be doing lots of these different events uh, all throughout the next coming weeks. It's gonna be fun, so make sure that you 
stay up to date on all of our social media pages. We'll be posting about them, uh, about future events we'll be having on Facebook Live, which will be pretty fun. And thank you very much for tuning in. If you have any questions, let us know in the comments, and we'll take a look and see if anybody has some good questions. Do we have any questions? No questions? That's okay. If you think of any, though, make sure to add them so we can answer them later on. No problem with that. Also, I would ask, consider becoming a member to the ENC. It helps us to feed and, and, and pay our animals, pay them in vet visits and places to live and things to eat. It helps to keep our animals healthy and safe and allows us to keep posting these really cool, uh, fun live events. Thank you for coming to these live events. Make sure to check out our website, encenter.org, for our next one and add it to your calendar and we'll see you there. Thanks, bye-bye.